Hello. Gut. Okay, so um, now we went through a little bit of a, a detailed stuff on um, Gaussian convolutions and, and um, full width half maxima and so on. So let's now um, um, yeah, look at the bigger picture again, where this reparameterization of smoothness uh, comes in and where it comes from. So um, as I previously um, uh, stated, um, the idea is now that we look at, of course, we have to look at 3D stuff um, now all the time. Um, we have a white noise uh, Gaussian random field, so that's white noise. And then we convolve this, so smooth this, with a Gaussian uh, convolution kernel. And the idea is now that this convolution kernel, let's call it uh, Kx, is Gaussian, so um, leaving away the normalization parameters, um, so just using a proportion, proportionality statement, um, we um, the the um, form that this takes is um, x t sigma x to the power of minus one, where um, of course, this is just the Gaussian form with, under the assumption that the uh, mu is zero because this is the convolution kernel. Um, and then we get a, um, a convolved 3D Gaussian, uh, no, a convolved, now we get a 3D Gaussian uh, um, random field because we assume that here the white noise is a Gaussian random field. So after convolving this with the Gaussian convolution kernel, we get something um, smooth in 3D. Um, so now the claim is, and um, the idea is, that if we want to compute our smoothness measure here, our sigma, what we need is the variance matrix of I would put a bracket first of the gradients of this field and assuming that this is um, that these gra this this is constant over space so not uh, depending on x um, we just need this uh, variance matrix yeah so this is what we uh, looked at now the claim is um, that if you um, apply a Gaussian convolution kernel to a white noise Gaussian field and you uh, this uh, convolution kernel has the following form So of course the important thing about the convolution kernel is the covariance function and uh, uh, sorry the covariance matrix and the covariance uh, matrix is of diagonal form so you um, yeah all the off diagonal elements are zero. The claim is then that this uh, variance uh, covariance um, no, not variance covariance matrix the variance uh, matrix of the um, gradients of the uh, random field evaluates um, two sigma minus one divided by two. Um, so um, let's write that up again. So the the claim is that this variance matrix of the gradient evaluates to sigma to the power of minus one divided by two. And um, of course, um, and this is what we'll do in a second, we uh, can express these um, sigma, uh, the sigma matrix in terms of full width half maxima. Before we do that, um, yeah, let's discuss what one actually would have to do this. So, um, What happens here is that um, 
one knows the covariance function of this white noise field, one also knows the mean function, which is zero, one knows the convolution kernel, and now one wants to make a statement about the derivatives of this random field and um, their variance matrix. And um, there are certain results in the theory of um, random fields um, that help in this regard, at least if one uh, stays in the um, in the real domain and doesn't look in, into the spectral um, representation, so uh, representing the whole thing in frequency space. But if one stays in the um, spatial domain or the um, real domain, there are things that help. For example, um, if one... Um, um, if one knows um, the gradients, uh, then one can um, evaluate the um, expectation function of the derivative of the random field. Or if one knows um, the uh, convolution kernel, so an integral kernel, then one can um, compute the expectation function of a random field under um, this convolution. And um, yeah, so one can basically start uh, trying to um, show this. The thing is, um, in the original publication by um, Worsley in 1992, there is, there is there's essentially just the claim that this holds. So it just says this evaluates like this based on Adler 1981. If, but there's no page uh, uh, indicated and um, this Adler book is relatively long. Uh, and actually, I went through the book a couple of times. Um, I mean, I read specific parts which uh, made sense to uh, uh, read, but uh, there's definitely, um, it definitely doesn't happen in, in, in the non-spectral form. Um, there is a little, there's a technical report by Mark Jenkinson from uh, FilmRip from 2000 that um, that's fairly close to what I did in this um, in this proof of uh, 4.32 in the script. Um, so I took a lot of inspiration from that, but did some things a little bit different. Um, I have the hope that uh, once I go into the spectral representation, that um, then this is easier to see. Um, so far, um, what um, I can confirm is that this holds for the diagonal elements. So what I mean is that what the proof here shows, of course, the inverse of this diagonal matrix is just um, 1, 2, sigma square x1, 1 over 2, sigma square x2, and 1, over 2 sigma square x3. So um, if you go th over this proof of 432, uh, I show that if you start with this thing and this white noise here, then the diagonal elements of this variance matrix of the um, partial derivatives, so this thing, this thing, and this thing, they actually come out as this. So this is, I can confirm. What I cannot confirm at this point is what happens to the off-diagonal elements. So the claim is that these are all zero, but I'm not so convinced <laughs> that this is actually the case. Um, I mean, I wasn't able to uh, um, show that and um, I'm also not quite convinced that I intuitively believe that. Um, but uh, I think uh, I will not uh, discuss that further at this point. So for the paper that I'm doing on this, um, I, um, yeah, I will go into the frequency domain. It's not that hard. I just didn't want to do it in, in the class here because that would add another layer of complexity to the whole thing, um, which um, I didn't want and because I'm not discussing this proof anyway, so it doesn't matter. So we believe the Worsley stuff as the whole community does. Um, but uh, both this Jenkinson report and also what I now do here based on actually the standard math on, of random fields, it works for the diagonal elements of this formula, but for the off-diagonal elements, I don't know. Um, but 
if we believe that um, this is actually true, which means that the uh, variance matrix of the pa of the uh, gradients of the random field evaluates to the inverse of this convolution kernel matrix divided by two, then we can uh, quite readily um, evaluate um, our um, smoothness measure now. So um, if we uh, believe this without having seen a full proof of the whole thing, so that this comes out as this, which is also in the fMRI literature often called lambda, um, then um, if we now um, replace um, the variance parameterization of the convolution kernel by its full width half maximum uh, representation, um, then um, we um, are essentially here. So the full width half maximum, um, let's look that up again, was 8 uh, ln, so that's um, here we have what we have on the diagonal is sigma square. I'm doing it for one first. So sigma square to the power of minus two, yeah, because it's um, the inverse, so it's this um, times one half, because that's what this says. So now let's look at this from the full width half maximum uh, perspective. So the um, um, the full width half maximum fx1 is um, square root 8 ln2 sigma x1. So this is the standard deviation. Now what we have to do is um, um, delete um, Give me a second. We have to um, do it wrong. We first have to um, bring this um, um, to the other side. So we have sigma uh, this equals f x one to the power uh, ln two to the power of minus one half. And then we have to take this to the um, power of minus 2. So we get this fx1 to the power of minus 2. And this is uh, minus uh, 1 half to the power of minus 2, which is um, just uh, 1. So we have 8 uh, ln 2. And then we have to take the half of it. So we get... Um, one half sigma square minus two x one divided by two. So we instead of eight we get four. So we get this four ln two f x one minus two. So um, our lambda or our variance matrix. Let's call this uh, both. Number corresponds to because we can do this uh, for our x1, x2, and x3 corresponds to 4 ln2. And here we have fx1 to the power of minus 2, fx2 to the power of minus 2, and fx3 to the power of minus 2. And the zeros that I'm putting in here are based on the assumption that uh, Worsley is right. I am not able to confirm this at this point. Um, and now um, we can actually, um, we, we see two things. First of all, um, the um, this is the gradient and this is normally um, dependent on space, but in this case it's um, um, the, the claim is that it's independent of uh, um, space. So if we now put this into a formula for the smoothness, 
So we take the det determinant of this lambda matrix um, to the power of minus one half uh, dx. Then, of course, what we are integrating over here is not dependent on x, so we um, just um, can take it out of the integral, and for the integral, um, we just get the integral um, from um, uh, um, 0 to 1 of um, um, the constant function, so of 1, so we get 1. So um, we just need to compute the determinant of um, this matrix and take it to the power of minus 1 half. Now the determinant of uh, this matrix, because it's a diagonal matrix, um, is um, just um, the product of the diagonal entries. So um, each diagonal entry has this 4 ln2 um, with it. So we have to take this to the power of 3. And we have um, our um, f x1, um, f x2, f x3 to the power of minus 2. And we have to take the whole thing to the power of minus one half. So from that we then get um, directly uh, four ln two to the power of minus three half, and minus two to the power of minus one half is then just our values. And this is um, what I initially uh, said the reparameterization uh, looks like. Yeah. So um, the magic happens at this step in this whole thing. The magic happens at this step where um, it is claimed that if you convolve a, a three-dimensional white noise Gaussian random field with a Gaussian uh, kernel that is... Um, um, is of this form that then the um, variance matrix of the gradients comes out as this. This is where the magic happens, where, as I said, I can show that um, this holds for the diagonal. That's okay, but for the off diagonal elements, I am not so sure. Maybe um, later this summer, I'm also sure about that, but I'm not at this point. If this holds, then um, the whole thing just comes down to actually substituting um, this uh, variance matrix of the spatial uh, gradients into our formula for the smoothness. And uh, using instead of um, using the variance parameterization of the Gaussian convolution kernel using the full width half maximum uh, parameterization of the uh, convolution kernel, this then actually leads to this um, formula. Which also means if you increase the smooth, uh, if you increase the width of one of these um, um, kernel that smooth this hypothetical white noise uh, Gaussian, then you get a larger smoothness. So it, it makes sense in terms of some parts of the intuition, but not, uh, uh, yeah, maybe not the whole. The whole thing is not uh, fully derived, especially not in the fMRI literature, which is interesting. And there are many things like that. Um, good, and we will actually need these values because uh, these values go into the definition of results. So, that was the smoothness reparameterization. Questions about this right now? Yeah, so, why, I mean, you said they probably didn't be motivated, but why would it be easier or better to have this Gaussian white noise smoothing assumptions compared to the first method that we discussed? Yeah, I don't know. So in, in the Worsley paper, um, you read, and also you read this in the Nichols and Hayasaka paper, that um, this variance matrix of the spatial gradient is not very intuitive. Uh -huh. and that this is more intuitive. But I think this is just a question of uh, how much effort you put into clarifying what this uh, spatial gradient matrix, uh, um, special variance matrix of the spatial gradient means, because we did last time, especially in the one-dimensional case, one can get a fairly good intuition of uh, why this is sensible. So, yeah, it's... Um, 
So my, so I mean, it's history of science. So I, I don't know what, what happened there. So my feeling is that in the first paper by Fristen that uses this reparameterization that only, uh, which was only applicable in the um, univariate case. So this just did things for one dimensional um, um, processes. So one dimensional fields, which are called uh, processes. There it didn't really matter because, um, and it might have been closer to how the, um, smoothness, uh, the smooth random fields were actually generated because I assume that this was written on MATLAB code that used independent realizations and then applied a smoothing kernel. And there, it really doesn't matter. And I think then um, the uh, Worsley stuff was uh, basically uh, like also uh, we work these days. So there's something in the literature, mm -hmm. Friston 1991, and uh, then you might do something else and it's always a good idea to start where somebody else has uh, left it off because um, otherwise you have to explain to everyone more why you're doing it differently. Um, it, there's another thing in this Worsley literature, especially the early Worsley literature, that um, he always only talks about, um, he never he never makes it explicit that these gradients uh, depend on space. So here, for this case where you have white noise and, and then you smooth it, they actually are independent of space or the same all over space. But in general, this is not true. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. So sometimes I, f I think like maybe he hasn't at that point, uh, so in the early 90s, he wasn't really into this thing and um, just... Um, so that the understanding of this uh, of this measure um, in the early 90s so of this thing here was not fully there so that um, this was not really established what this actually means and especially this question about what is the variance over is this uh, a variance over realizations of the uh, gradient fields or just the variance over space that's what i sometimes feel but sometimes then other things seem to contradict that but this uh, thing definitely so in the uh, literature by Jonathan Taylor and everything that then works on Lipschitz Keening curvatures and so on um, this comes up as the fundamental smoothness measure so I don't know but uh, the problem or the, the reason why I bring up both things of course from a teaching perspective it would be much nicer to uh, leave out this whole reparameterization business because it just makes things more complicated but um, or leave this out but then I don't think that this uh, with the hypothetical white noise Gaussian and field really makes for a straightforward teaching story mm -hmm. so the reason why I have to do both is because they both of them feature in the software yeah like I said uh, DFG project three years Somebody with a PhD in math should sit down and clean this all up. And then uh, the community has a nicer software, which actually might be easier to understand than it's currently, because it, uh, and it can also be um, conveyed to other people more straightforward. Because this, the thing that we have this reparameterization now will also play an important role in this whole volumetrics result business. The results they also wouldn't really exist if this were, if it wasn't for this reparameterization, and they, there's no need that they exist because they only exist in the brain imaging community and not in the uh, real world. <sighs> Cognitive neuroimaging, a great field. <laughs> um, any other questions? Okay, so then we won't be able to do much of volumetrics, but we can at least start. So we have now studied uh, uh, random fields. We know how we can sample from random fields. We know how we can compute the smoothness of random fields. We actually also know how we can give another expression of random fields. We don't really know how to uh, compute that, though we'll see an estimation procedure um, later on um, and for that. And now we have to talk about something totally different. But the motivation is uh, still the same. So, um, volumetrics. So we're now talking about how to measure volumes. Why are we talking about this? 
The reason is as follows. Um, you might recall that our smoothness measure that we discussed was defined on this um, on this unit uh, cubed or square or um, um, interval. So we now if we look at this like this, um, we have one and we have two realizations. So we have something smooth and we have something non smooth. We now can say, okay, this is smooth and this is. Uh, um, um, not smooth. But what we actually are interested in is to make statements of how likely it is that over a given search space a random field um, exceeds a, a certain um, exer uh, 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 exceeds a certain uh, threshold or level u. Now, this not only depends on how smooth things are, but also on how big the space is. So if we um, increase um, the uh, domain of the uh, random field, so if we allow um, also here to uh, the thing to vary, then of course the probability that uh, this exceeds the threshold over the entire space depends both on the smoothness and the size of the space. So simply if you have uh, the same um, thing, the same th smoothness of a random field over um, 0 to 1, there might be a certain probability that at least the maximum uh, um, is larger than a threshold. If you make the space a lot larger, then the probability that um, the maximum exceeds the threshold, um, so you have one um, location in space where um, the maximum of the um, uh, process is above the threshold, of, of course, also increases. So we will see a formal description of this in the following, but um, these are these two things, and these are very important and, and will feature all the time. So. We will later see an expression for what is called the Euler characteristic, um, and this uh, expression, and this is this is really where where the good stuff is in the whole uh, random field theory uh, based PBU uh, correction. This can uh, um, or this factors into a measure of um, an integrated measure of volume and smoothness, and um, uh, um, a measure that is only dependent on the type of a uh, random field. So we need we need both smoothness and we need an expression for uh, space. So this is, I think, as much as motivation I can give uh, before I have to give all of the other uh, details. So, and um, the way to measure volumes um, is of course a part of uh, geometry or differential geometry uh, in, in, in the modern age. And um, you know certain things of how to measure volume and we will constantly see them. So for example, if you have um, a rectangle with side length A and B, what's the volume or the area of this? A, B. And if you have a cuboid in 3D with um, height, width, and depth C, what's the volume of this? Exactly. And um, this is exactly the thing that we will um, talk about. So, but we will talk about it in more general terms. The fundamental idea is that um, we look at uh, subsets of at most three-dimensional space, so x1, x2, and x3. And in this three-dimensional space, there exists objects. And these objects might not necessarily be that nice as this floating uh, cuboid here, 
but they uh, might be uh, of more interesting shapes, for example, like um, the brain. And we want to assign volumes to that. And the first volumes that we want to assign are um, now, fairly fundamental that don't take into account smoothness, and then later we actually want to also assign them uh, a volume that takes into account the smoothness of a random process that, uh, that uh, um, is defined on this volume. But the whole thing uh, is about really to uh, give a number. So here uh, you said the number for this is ABC, so the volume is ABC. And if we have more intricate shapes, um, we want to assign a number to it. So, for example, 12. The volume of this brain is 12. And um, this is, um, yeah, this is kind of uh, where measure theory and uh, modern geometry basically uh, yeah, um, um, play out. So they um, they are really concerned with these questions: How can you ascribe volume um, or measures of volume to geometric entities that are either idealized in terms of subsets of R3 or maybe also then realized in terms of um, um, uh, um, yeah, um, discrete approximation of these things. How you can, can you assign volumes that fulfill certain conditions? And we will discuss three kinds of volumes. Um, the first being Lebesgue measure. So that's not the Lebesgue integ integral. Um, but it's important also in the Lebesgue integral, but we will talk about Lebesgue uh, measure. Why do we talk about Lebesgue measure? Well, because very important volumes in fMRI, random field uh, theory-based p-value co corrections, namely the so-called intrinsic volumes, are defined in terms of Lebesgue measure. So why do we talk about intrinsic volumes? Well, because the infamous or famous Riesels in fMRI are defined in terms of intrinsic volumes. So um, Lebesgue measure can be seen as kind of the uh, first principle measure that we introduce. And based on this foundation, we can then talk about intrinsic volumes, which are specific Lebesgue measures, essentially. And uh, based on the intrinsic volumes of geometric entities, we can then talk about Riesel volumes, which are uh, specific intrinsic volumes. Yeah, and uh, so in this way, we actually relate the concept of Riesels to um, a fundamental quantity that is also standard in math. So that it's not that uh, brain imaging always talks about these strange quantities that nobody outside of brain imaging has ever heard of, but we relate it back to um, the uh, measure that is um, yeah around in math and mathematicians and uh, also other people who work on normal stuff, not cognitive neuroimaging, imaging, um, know about. Um, a problem with these uh, things is that the definitions are fairly abstract and often don't give you a way to um, actually now compute something. Um, we will later, uh, when we talk about the numerics of the whole thing, uh, see how we can compute intrinsic volumes, actually, uh, how, uh, for voxels. So, of course, we will later be interested in computing um, voxel uh, volumes and uh, so, uh, no, not voxel volumes, but uh, compute the um, um, volume of, of a brain, which we have imaged, and then we only have voxels, and we need the intrinsic volumes of this image uh, brain, and this can be computed based on an algorithm, which we will also discuss, which is also implemented in SPM uh, in a C function, actually, uh, written by John Ashburner, with a reference to the 1996 Worsley pattern. So um, we will uh, see how this is actually computed. Um, but before we see how this actually computed, it makes sense to go over what this means from a um, theoretical perspective. The thing is, these intrinsic volumes um, and also the back measure, they are uh, they are um, so specifically, if, or at least for me, intrinsic volumes. They are really 
deep into what is called integral geometry and this is closely related to differential geometry so that's a big chunk of mathematics that I actually don't know anything about um, so it's um, it's quite far from what I usually do in math uh, which is more applied and of course more probabilistic this is all non uh, applied uh, and non um, probabilistic so I also had to look into that, so I'm trying to give you the gist of it, but I'm definitely not an expert on intrinsic volumes or these things. That being said, um, there is uh, so the, the modern work by Jonathan Taylor and Robert Adler on um, all of these things. They actually went quite far into the um, uh, in differential geometry literature, and um, yeah, this now plays an important role in the whole thing. Good, that was maybe a little bit confusing, and now time is almost up. What the fuck? Um, yeah, how can we start? Well, um, let's just start with Lebesgue measure, and then uh, next time we continue with the rest. So, Lebesgue measure. Why are we talking about it? Because intrinsic measures are expressed in terms of Lebesgue measure and results are uh, expressed in terms of intrinsic measures. So always keep this in mind if you think this is now a little bit far out what we are doing. Um, so, um, what is the motivation for Lebesgue uh, measure? So, um, the basic motivation is as follows. You think about, for example, um, R2, and you think about some geometric object in R2, which is not a rectangle and which is not a disk, but something more funky. And you want to uh, assign a volume, or of course, an R2, um, an area to it. Always, uh, You should always think about uh, one-dimensional, two-dimensional, and three-dimensional volumes. Um, actually, uh, the one-dimensional volumes are, of course, length. The two-dimensional volumes are, of course, areas. And the three-dimensional volumes are, of course, volumes. And the back measure was motivated uh, by assigning, um, yeah, being able to assign some measure to these kind of general geometric objects, which should fulfill certain conditions. Um, so that's, I think, uh, how this can be uh, nicely motivated. Um, so um, The, um, the desiderata, so you want to come up with a mathematical measure uh, that fulfills certain desirable properties are the following are it's compatible with um, length area and volume for lines, rectangles, and cuboids. So what this just means is that you want a general measure and if you apply this general measure to a line, a rectangle, or a cuboid, what you get is, yeah, you should compute the line, uh, length of the line, or you should compute the area, so the um, product of the um, of the height and the width, or you should compute the volume by multiplying the height, width, and depth. Yeah, so that's one thing that is uh, desired. Um, then the other thing that is desired is that it's uh, um, smaller for object object A than object B. So you're thinking about two subsets of the uh, real numbers now um, that um, we call object A and object B. 
and um, it should be smaller for object A than for object B if um, A is a subset of B essentially or more intuitively if you can uh, put uh, object um, B into object A. You can of course start thinking about oh well if I warp this does it fit and so on but um, it's it's more derived actually from the idea that it's a, really a subset uh, of that yeah so this is kind of what is well, I think it's usually called what's it called homogeneity maybe not um, so just a very intuitive thing that if something is uh, if you can fit something into something else then this uh, volume of the thing where you can fit something in is larger than the other things. Um, it should be additive for non-overlapping objects. So if you have this and then you have another object here and clearly they don't overlap, so you should also if I'm saying objects and say geometric things, you should always think that uh, these things here, A, this is a subset of R2, right? And this B here is a subset of R2, 2. Um, so you should always think that objects and things are modeled as subsets of um, two-dimensional or three-dimensional or one-dimensional uh, real space and you want to assign volumes to it which is not easy because if you think about the real numbers there are infinitely many uh, real numbers already in um, yeah in, in an interval yeah so that's the question how you actually assign volume now it should be additive means that if you uh, look at the volume of these two together then you should add this one and this one um, and ah there's one thing that I forgot it's actually the other way around um, it should be invariant under translation this means if you have this subset of uh, the real numbers here and you now um, move this subset um, so of course these are all um, x1 and x2 that depending on how this is uh, set up here let's say this is five so then these are x1 and x2 which are large where x1 is larger than one let's say and x no sorry x x2 is larger than one x1 is larger than two and then it's really hard to give this a formal expression uh, how this is for for circle it's easy that you can do something with the square and the uh, and the radius but for these kind of things to find a function that this described this is really quite hard now if translation invariant just means that if you have this here and you add something constant to all of them for example add something to all the x2 uh, values and then you have it here should be the same thing now looks a little bit different um, then the volume is the same yeah so this is how one uh, can say okay we want to we want to come up with a measure that fulfills these things and then you can propose a formula which um, I think we will do next time then you can propose a formula uh, how to compute this and then you can check based on this formula how uh, whether these things actually hold true so this is something that also neuroimaging people like to do i think like i think of many things it's a little bit boring um so for example if you think of um integrated information theory for example um there people try to come up with a measure of consciousness so they set up there's some desiderata say okay it should be this this and this then they come up with a formula and then they should but don't uh, show that this formula actually fulfills their desiderata and then you have a measure and but always keep in mind that this measure uh, is just a formula that you can apply to something um, and you get a number from it yeah there's nothing else but I don't have time anymore now to um, actually talk about uh, the Lebesgue measure uh, formally. So we will start with that next week. Good. Any questions so far about volumetrics? Yes. So point C, additive for non-overlapping objects. Why isn't it easy to have something for overlapping? 
because brains we only deal with one brain or uh, no it should be no and this, uh, first of all, the back measure has nothing to do with brains. So that was uh, developed by Lebesgue in the late 19th century, actually in the context of giving a proper definition for integrals. Um, so um, brain mapping was a long way uh, uh, from that. Um, mm, for so, I mean, of, that's something like uh, like uh, sigma additivity, also, right? So it's. It, the thing is, if you um, have overlapping things, so I mean, if you just look at a Venn diagram of things, so if you have, um, it's fairly clear, or one can be, it can be a clear desiderata if you have something like this and uh, something touching it, maybe, mm -hmm. then you can say, okay, the volume of this is uh, the volume of A plus the volume of B. But if you have um, now something, uh, let's take another color, something that overlaps, then of course um, the question is, what do you do with this volume? And of course you should subtract it. But then you also have, if you want to uh, give a volume to the uh, to this new object com being, or this new subset of uh, two-dimensional real space. Uh, being composed of A and C, but then you also have to have, if you want to subtract that, um, uh, have a formula um, how to compute this. And of course, one could uh, have uh, another desideratum that um, that somehow um, here um, the volume would be A plus C minus the uh, the conjunction of A and C, but it's just not a DZT Okay. Yeah. And um, maybe sometimes one can actually show, um, but I didn't go that deep into the whole thing. And I will also not show that these things actually hold for the back measure. I'm just telling you that they will hold for the back measure. One can uh, then sometimes show that this is equivalent. Mm -hmm. So um, if you, for example, look at these definitions of um, in um, metric theoretic probability theory of oh, I don't know of, of certain things then uh, sometimes these things for example in um, combination I'm not sure whether this is true here but maybe this in combination with this actually implies that uh, A plus B minus the overlapping surface this. Okay. Yeah, I'm not saying that this is true here it might not be um, but this is how sometimes these things uh, work out, and then you have um, even more intuitions uh, for for a given measure than the ones that are necessary to um, actually show that this is a sensible measure. Yeah. Good. Then uh, we stop here, and uh, I see you again next week.